Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are fortunate to have uh, Jay here, and hopefully Larry Sakowitz, our other rep, will join us. I hear Mark McDonald is there at the school, and welcome Jeff Francis, um, who is uh, the executive director of the Vermont Superintendents Association. Thanks for joining us as well. Um, first, I do need to assign or uh, ask someone to volunteer to be a meeting evaluator. Do I have a uh, volunteer for that tonight. Amongst one of our board members. Hannah, would you be willing to do that? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, Ashley. Okay. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks for volunteering. All right. Um, I would, is there any public comment? Um, we did uh, have a schedule for some time for public comment. There will also be time uh, after we hear from the legislators. Um, but I did want to make sure that if someone had something non-related to what we're going to be talking about later, they ha could have a couple of minutes now. Hearing none, I'm going to... Um, Give the floor to Jeff, Francis, and Jay, and Mark. Um, thanks. Thanks again for joining us. Sure. Um, first, I want to check my audio. Am I coming through okay? I've had some trouble with my internet today, so I hope that that matter is resolved. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to meet with you, uh, be it on an online platform. One of the highlights of my winter each year is coming down to Randolph to meet you with, with you all and give you a little bit of update on what's happening um, in the, in Montpelier. Um, as you know, um, the dynamics for the General Assembly have been affected by the pandemic, just like the pandemic has affected everyone else. And it's really um, a different form of interaction that we have, whereas uh, in a typical year, you would be visiting committees and talking to people such as Senator McDonald. I haven't had occasion to see him um, virtually yet this year. I've been visiting the House Education Committee where Jay is a member, um, but it's different. Um, and the, the high priority for the state in general is navigating the pandemic, but the dynamics in public education have caused the General Assembly to turn into an array of issues that are not um, central to the pandemic, um, but are reflective of what um, is necessary and desired in public education in general. So what I thought I'd do is just sort of give you the high points on what I've observed in the session so far, talk a little bit about key pieces of legislation and then step back, let you have a discussion amongst yourself with the legislators maybe some of it in response to what I'm about to say, but I'm sure that they've got some topics to bring up with you as well. Um, so there's a resource that goes out to school board members and administrators, the um, education legislative update. And the last one um, was published at the end of January. And there's a lot of comprehensive information in there about the status of legislation currently. Um, but there's a few things that are happening that aren't reflected in that report. Um, so I'll hit the high point of the um, of the report first um, and then talk about uh, another issue or two. Uh, so the, the first piece of legislation affecting schools out of the box was H48. And that was the bill that allowed um, municipal legislative bodies, including school districts, to move the date of their 2021 annual meeting to a later date if they chose and also require the clerk to mail out 2020 annual, annual meeting um, absentee Australian ballots. So that was a, <clears throat> a COVID specific response. Uh, school districts weighed in heavily in the development of that legislation, really with two things in mind. One, for unified union school districts, there was an interest in making sure that the municipalities that made up those districts to the extent they were able, all voted on the same date. Um, and 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 two, um, we wanted to make sure that uh, local school officials 
we're working closely with um, town clerks in particular in order to accomplish that. There was a statement of intent in that bill that indicated that that bill has been approved. And I'm, I would imagine that your plans in your district for for your voting are, are all set. So that was one issue. Um, another significant issue that um, has not, it's a bill that hasn't been enacted into law, but it was um, intended to convey to school district officials an improved picture related to the um, yield for every dollar of taxation. So you'll recall that in December, the letter that went from the tax commissioner to leaders in the General Assembly basically forecast a very bleak and dismal um, fiscal outlook for the coming year and a yield that was based on pandemic circumstances at the time and specifically with respect to education, a, a very sizable deficit um, in the education fund. Um, because of some broad-based taxes, and, and Mark McDonald knows this better than I do, the, the, the picture for the Ed Fund improved dramatically on what I think is a one-year um, scenario, but it allowed the Ways and Means Committee to pass a bill out of their committee that increased the yield um, for a dollar of resident property taxation to $11,385. That, that was up uh, measurably over the um, the yield last year. And, you know, I, I don't like to characterize it this way because I think that uh, everything is sort of more moderate than this, but school district officials across the state um, did breathe a sigh of relief because some folks were dealing with very modest increases in education spending, modest increases in ed spending per pupil, um, but they were seeing pretty substantial tax rate increases. And the increase in the yield had the effect of um, moderating those tax rates. I think it was to the credit of the, um, the Ways and Means Committee, and I expect to the credit of the General Assembly uh, in total when, they, when that bill uh, is ultimately acted upon, that they recognize the need that school districts were experiencing with regard to their FY22 budgets. And they took the, um, the yield calculation to a place that reflected what the current status of the education fund is. So that was another significant action. Um, right now, there is a pretty vigorous deliberation going on around the construct for statewide bargaining for school employees' health benefits. Um, two bills that are under consideration in the House General Affairs Committee, RH63 and H81. Um, the last year, the um, uh, well, the the state um, completed its first round of bargaining for school employees' health care at the statewide level, and the commissioners on the um, on the ed, the um, employers side um, raised some concerns about considerations for affordability in the context of those negotiations. So there were two bills that were introduced to the House Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs. One's H-63, the other's H-81. The H-63 um, was the bill that was reflective of the views of the employers and the school boards association. And it had a couple of um, very significant proposals in it. Um, one was to ask both sides in the negotiation to submit a full cost estimate for the respective proposal uh, with a breakdown of how the cost within that proposal would be borne by employers and employees. And a second pretty significant proposal was a requirement for an arbitration panel to determine which of the two proposals most appropriately balances um, healthcare benefits and reasonable cost containment. Um, so th that issue of whether the um, underlying statute for that statewide uh, negotiation, the second round, for, so, they're, so bargaining is about to start again for the second cycle um, in, this, uh, in this method of establishing those healthcare benefits in April, and the 
the the um, the House General Affairs Committee is deliberating uh, what provisions they'll put in a bill. Um, so that's something that we're keeping an eye on. There was an estimate that the last best offer that was accepted by the arbitrator in the in the round, which is affecting health insurance costs right now, um, may have added up to twenty five million dollars cost statewide because of the um, negotiation that was or the proposal that was selected. I'm not an expert on this bill because the lead on it is the school boards association. So my colleague, Sue Saglowski, um has been paying close attention to this, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a piece of legislation or an issue that we covered um, pretty extensively in the legislative report. So you may already be familiar with it, but it's something that at least in its first iteration, which would be a vote by the, by the, um, uh, House Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs is likely they're they're likely to vote on it this week and possibly as as soon as tomorrow. Um, I also wanted to talk about another very significant issue that the General Assembly is taking up, which is the um, the response to the so-called waiting study, Act One Seventy Three, um, which was approved several years ago included a, a requirement that um, the General Assembly uh, cause the Agency of Education to commission a study to see if the weights that are applied in our education funding formula um, uh, for uh, students in different age, or excuse me, grade configurations and uh, students from lower socioeconomic status or for for those for whom um, English is a second language were appropriate. There was a um, ex extensive study that was conducted by Professor Tam Tammy Colby from UVM with um, uh, colleagues from around the country who were experts in education funding. That study found that um, our weights were um, not up to date as it were, and there were recommendations put in, in that um, study for adjusting the weights. And the legislature is grappling right now with a couple of different proposals on how to adjust those weights. There's a bill in the House, H54, and one in the, seven, in the Senate, S13. Um, they take somewhat different approaches in that H54 would move into an acceptance of the uh, weight recommendations from the study and implement them over several years in order to mitigate the tax rate changes that would happen in communities that would lose equalized pupils as a result of the weightings um, being changed. And then the Senate um, takes a, uh, a probably a, um, well, it's a different approach. Their bill is S13. And that requires a process of community education, recommendations on implementation, um, which involve sort of a more collaborative approach, including the education associations and the agency of education. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the disposition will be of the General Assembly with respect to this. That hasn't started to um, really reveal itself yet. But what I will say is that it is um, a pretty significant matter to change the weights. Um, I don't think anybody questions the study that acknowledges that the weight should be changed, but the tax rate implications um, uh, as a result of changing equalized pupils uh, uh, responding to weight changes is measurable in some communities. So at least for the Superintendents Association, we've been talking about approach and values as opposed to the outcomes because uh, it's pretty hard to represent all communities in the state um, from a district to district perspective because the implications of the weight changes um, may have. I'm not sure how your district's affected. Lane may know, but there's plenty of information online um, that would help you uh, understand that. Um, something else that uh, we're happy to see underway right now, the House Education Committee is trying to do what it can to um, get school construction aid restarted in some form or fashion. There was a suspension on school construction aid in 2007 
So for all intents and purposes, except for emergency situations, the state has not been contributing to capital construction aid um, through any type of capital construction aid program, at least. Um, so we are working to support a bill that would um, see a analysis of uh, facilities in Vermont statewide, sort of get a benchmark on the overall condition, um, restore capital construction aid, upgrade the standards for school buildings, et cetera. Um, so that's one aspect of this issue. Another aspect of the issue is both responding to and preparing to respond to, to the uh, matter of um, need for health and safety improvements in schools. So you'll recall that a couple of years ago, the General Assembly passed legislation that was intended to address lead and um, uh, drinking water uh, to, in schools. Um, we now have the, um, in the uh, uh, environmental situation up in Burlington with PCBs, that contamination. So with an aging stock of um, schools like we have in Vermont, we know that th these schools are gonna need upgrade and improvement both environmentally and just in terms of their physical space. So we're working with the General Assembly to turn into that um, this year. Uh, another big sort of news item, um, and again, Senator McDonald probably has been thinking about this and, and because I know it's been discussed in his committee, um, are the um, the current liabilities of the pension fund. So uh, Treasurer Beth Pierce has been traveling from committee to committee in the state house, explaining the circumstances associated with pension funds, um, which are pretty bleak, frankly. Um, and we've reached a point where the treasurer's recommendations are to adjust the um, the contributions and benefits that would be available to um, future retirees in the from the with it, who are participating in the pension fund, and that's something that uh, it is very concerning to us because there's no apparent resolution. And if teachers are asked more to contribute to the pension fund system and then be beneficiaries down the road of lesser retirement. It takes Vermont's system, which is already doesn't compare favorably to many other in the country, and exacerbates a situation where we're trying to make sure that we can re recruit personnel to our system. Um, so that that is something that is um, uh, we're we're really playing paying close attention to. Um, I'll, I'm going to pause there because I've given you a fair amount to think about and reflect upon. And I suspect that uh, that Jay and Mark will want to weigh in with perspectives on um, at least one or two of the items that I've spoken about. So thanks very much for allowing me to join you. And I'm happy to participate in the conversation from this point forward. Should I go ahead, Madam Chair? So for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Jay Hooper. I represent the five towns of Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury in the state legislature. This is my third term. It's my second term on the House Education Committee, and I am forever grateful that uh, Jeff Francis is in my committee daily and comes here to, to tell us in great detail uh, what's going on. So um, the waiting study is something I would want to 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 add perspective to it's something it's a it's such a huge topic that i believe this um well as jeff mentioned the 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 legislature at large uh there's no way to gauge sort of when that issue might sort of start start becoming a conversation that the general assembly is engaging with collectively because well frankly it takes it takes the the vermont Principals Association, a minimum of 11 minutes to explain the basics, right? Just the nuts and bolts of our education funding structure uh, on a YouTube video, which uh, I would encourage you all to review over and over. 
um, which means that each of the new members of the House Education Committee and even those of us who have had a few years uh, of exposure to this um, to this structure, this process, this system, um, it's extremely difficult to wrap your head around and therefore make decisions as to how it should change. So mm, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but I think there's four or just about half a dozen current weights, W-E-I-G-H-T uh, weights in the, the funding formula of today, which is obsolete and uh, maybe never really was based on um, accurate metrics. Uh, but uh, the Tammy Colby, uh, the Professor Colby and Professor uh, Baker uh, study that was commissioned by the agency through Act 178, uh, I think it includes uh, eight or 10 weights. So, so uh, several additional, several new categories. So this is a conversation that's going to take several legislative sessions uh, to see uh, a change. Uh, the, the, the various bills that Jeff just mentioned will probably see the light of day this session, but it will, I, I would doubt that that would come to a vote until at least next year or maybe later. Um, one of the things I'd like to emphasize to you all this evening is that uh, there's sort of a consensus in the House Education Committee and uh, potentially also uh, over in the other chamber that right now, uh, being that we're halfway or better uh, through a pandemic, um, we've been so disconnected with what was normal uh, that we actually have an opportunity now to redefine what's normal. So. I don't know if there are there's a wish list on this school board for things that would change, you know, fundamental changes like, for example, uh, how long the school day is or, uh, um, well, something like that. You know, that that's the kind of thing that we're we're looking into or uh, how can we better utilize uh, public buildings like uh, schools, you know, because they're empty all summer and empty all night. Um, um, Amongst, uh, well, I guess other than all the things that Mr. Francis just articulated well, I guess the only thing I don't, I don't know if he mentioned literacy. We maybe will take on uh, the sequel to lead, which would be radon uh, remediation. Um, but, uh, you know, I think between teachers' pensions, the waiting study, and school construction, it seems to me like the House Education Committee will have quite a full plate. Um, and so I, you know, I actually, I think there's a push from the chair and a couple other members that, that we pick up where we left off before the pandemic hit last March on, uh, on the literacy, uh, topic. So, uh, Senator Mark McDonald, if you have anything to add, uh, I, I, I'm happy for questions afterwards. He's, he's coming up. I'm going to set him right in front of my computer and, and you're on and live the second you step down. Thank you, Jay. Um, Mr. Francis's presentation um, strikes me as having a three adjusts and one readjust. Um, I have a copy of the um, editorial from a member of the School Boards Association about the um, the new health care plan where the, it was decided amongst the various parties that the state would and the teachers would put together um, bargain statewide. And this year that's been for a readjustment. The, um, the first item that what came up was how much money was going to be raised by current taxes to operate our schools. And in September, um, the, the view was there's it was going to be desperately short. And a few weeks ago, um, there's a healthy surplus, and the revenues are really a roller coaster. There's a consensus that um, a decision probably should not be made on that in the next few weeks. And wait for the roller coaster to kind of level out because that will determine the yield that makes sense. Um, the weighting of pupils, if your pupil is has a higher weight, um, 
you should be entitled to more money to run your schools. And if your pupils have lower weights, then perhaps they've got enough money and you don't need as much. Um, that's a heck of an adjustment. And in the legislature, adjustments like that are made only when there's enough money to make sure that no one loses. If you're gonna make changes, if we are gonna make changes on weighted pupils, um, you're not gonna get a change unless you can keep the school districts whole that are likely to lose funding. And um, it's pretty much a rule of thumb. Um, and last of all, anyone who can explain how the current funding system works in 11 minutes um, ought to be on a speaking tour. Um, That's Nicole Mace, I believe. Actually, they they leave a few things out, Senator McDonald, in order uh, to get it to in order to get it to 11 minutes. But it's pretty good. It's pretty good video. I'm um, shocked that something so got left out. It's um, on the school boards association website. Um, when Act 60 was being put together, uh, there was a meeting in Stratford, Vermont, and it was being, the proposal was being explained, and um, someone asked, how can you trust the legislature to fully fund this new plan? And um, Paul Silo stood up and threw his hands in the air and says, trust the legislature? Are you kidding? You can't trust the legislature because they only last two years. And then you have to deal with a new legislature and they don't have, they're not obliged to do what the previous folks did. Well, that bill eventually got passed and it's been in place for um, coming on 22 years now. And that that is a shockingly long time for legislatures excuse me, for state aid plans to work. And I I want to add a, a little second story on to explaining how the current system works. After it passed into law, it took about an, a year to put it into place. And uh, Jay, your father um, had a group of Russians who were visiting the United States to come and see how democracy worked in the United States. And there was a meeting over in the town of Washington and explained, there was an explanation of how the, the state aid formula worked and it took an hour. And it was a night like tonight where people were cold and ready to go home. And when the explanation was finished, everybody looked at each other and said with their eyes, I don't wanna hear any questions, we wanna go home. And, um, then was a voice from the back of the room and the Russian guests, one stood up and he says in a Russian accent, this is very good plan. How can you trust the legislature to fully fund it? And the fellow that was explaining it um, didn't know how to tackle the question. Well, the answer was in Stratford and then again in Washington, you need to have a formula that works no matter what the legislature does. You have to have one where everybody is affected if there are any changes. If you're gonna, you have to be prepared to make it work no matter who the legislature is. So you've got, we're looking at a rewrite, attempted rewrite of the healthcare statewide contract negotiations, you're looking at measuring pupils differently and assigning money differently, and you're looking at revenue sources that are going up and down like a roller coaster. Um, and I was amused by the school boards association saying that they were trying to look at this as an issue of values instead of an issue of money. which is my hat's off to them if we can get away with looking at it as values instead of money, but to change and recognize school districts that are, have a, a tougher challenge than others is gonna require answers that are um, tougher and cost more. Same with um, 
same with teachers retirement. I have a story on that one, but I'll save it. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Jay and Jeff. Um, questions from anyone uh, who is attending this meeting? Uh, do you have questions for um, any of our presenters? Nora, go ahead. Hi. Um, I don't know if it's so much a question as, as a comment, but I, I'm going to go for it here. Um, one is I, I want to speak to, to two of the issues that the legislators have brought up that I think affects a lot of people at this meeting. Um, that is the, the health care, um, the fixes that, that are needed um, for the health care negotiations. And um, as I want to put a, another plug in for um, H81, um, that's the proposal that would allow the negotiators to negotiate separate um, co-payments for um, people depending on income, having income sensitivity, basically. So um, it, it's really unfair um, to ask somebody who is earning um, maybe $15,000 um, a year to have the same co-pay um, in terms of percentage of the premium that they're asked to share or to pay their part of as someone who earns um, $80,000 or $100,000 a year. And we already have many people who can't afford um, the health insurance that is being offered um, because that percentage, that amount is so high and to, to make it be equal is, is just um, not right. So want to put a plug in for that one. Um, I also wanted to, to mention on the pensions. Um, I, I realized that there's a lot of things floating around out there. And, um, but I, I think there needs to be some discussion about the, the root of the problem and not having the solution come off of the backs of um, teachers. Um, teachers have put the amount that's been asked of them um, regularly into it. And that money has been taken um, and over the course of years spent on other things. Um, so instead of investing it as the, the legislature, as the state has agreed on their part of it to invest it into the pension fund, um, they've taken the money that was supposed to go into the pension fund and used it on other things. And now there's the deficit in the pension fund. Um, and we're being asked from, or at least it's being proposed out there by some people to have that come um, now off of us as well. Um, and that, again, I would say is really not right. And, and I would urge our legislators and our board members to speak in opposition um, of that. Thank you. Um, hi. <laughs> you guys don't know me really. And uh, um, <clears throat> I, not, not many of you know me, but I teach art at the high school. And um, I just want to weigh in, if I could, a little bit. Um, because uh, it's been interesting. I've heard some conversation about um, <clears throat> the, uh, the pension system going to a contract system, right? And, you know, so that your contract, you're written into a contract uh, with your pension. Well, speaking for myself, it's always been a contract, okay? When I signed up to be a teacher 21 years ago, it was a contract that I would have a stable pension. I may have not entered the profession if that wasn't a piece of it. Yearly, we're asked to contribute more, we're asked to, we're, um, our benefits are depleted more, and the things that we went into understanding as careers have been picked away at slowly, consistently. And I asked the board, I asked our administrators, to get everybody on the same side because this is not a us versus them thing. This is a systemic situation that needs to be rectified and we have to pull together to do this. Um, and I just, in parting comment, I just wanna say that you know, if, if our pensions are picked away at, you know, we're looking at um, older folks, senior citizens, um, running into situations where their livelihoods are endangered, okay? 
Um, maybe they can't keep their homes. Maybe they can't keep their health care. Maybe they can't keep these things that are essential and, again, things that they agreed that were a contract when they started teaching many years ago. Okay, what is it going to cost the state of Vermont to subsidize those people when those things like housing and health fall apart? It's going to be a lot more than paying the pensions that we all agreed on long ago. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you both for for your remarks and uh, we're, I hear you. Um, anybody else have anything to add to that? Um, this is Tev Kelman, if I could speak. Sorry, I'm not sure if I should raise my hand, but um, yeah, sure, man, I think- Thank, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think Craig, you, you said everything that needed to be said beautifully. I just wanted to add a, a couple more points. Um, one is that I've heard in some of my outreach to my local legislators, um, this idea that, that they agree that changing the pension for current retirees or even currently vested retirees isn't fair, but people coming you know, into the system in the future should um, have, you know, should, should see it restructured. And again, I just want to say the people that we're talking about are, if, if that is, you know, a, a, a compromise being considered, are the people who are going to determine what our schools look like, you know, when my kids are graduating um, in, in 15 or 20 years. Um, and I think we should also remember that this generation of people coming out of college into the workforce is under historically crushing college debt. Um, and so, I, you know, I think the idea that people are talented people, right? Because, you know, the people I work with are talented people. And a lot of them are people who, who can and have done other work in their, in their lives. And I think um, I just really want to underscore the point that Craig was making about, like, the investment in the future of our of our state's um, workforce, but you know more than that, like our society, if if we see um, this as as something that that we can afford to do, um, and I guess the other point I just wanted to make is I'm confused, and I don't expect an answer, you know, because this is pretty inside baseball, but I'm just very confused about given the performance of markets over the past you know, 10 or 12 years since the Great Recession, and particularly given what I understand has been a really strong recovery at the top 10 or 20% of the income scale. I'm very confused why the state feels that, um, you know, working people, people making 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe $60,000 a year are the ones who need to pay for this mess. And why, why um, this, yeah, why, why this gap wasn't dealt with through raising revenue during the good times. Um, so those are just two points that I wanted to add to what Craig was saying. Thank you. And if I could just add something, I'm sorry, I'm Beverly Taft. My camera's not working, so I can't, I can't show myself. But um, one thing I also wanted to piggyback on what Tev was just sharing is Senator Hooker has also introduced S-59, which looks at a tax surcharge uh, for folks that have done so well and have um, incomes of 500000 or greater. Um, so we've got some things on the table. The governor's assured um, funding for this year, which I know we're just kicking the can down the road. But, I, you know, Jay and, and Mark, I'm, I'm going to appeal to you guys that hopefully people are slowing down. And I get that the Senate pro tem and the speaker, you know, want this all taken care of super quickly, which is baffling to me. But, um, you know, we've got some things on the table that that can help dig us out of this hole. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to to appeal to you both to to look beyond the fuzzy math that tends to get tossed about when it comes to um, our pension and some of the um, things that Treasurer Pierce is recommending. Uh, 
Are there other comments or questions for the legislature, slate tours and for Jeff? David White. Thank you, Laura. Um, different topic, though I support the um, the idea of our legislators pushing back on the treasurer on that subject. So I do hope you do that. But I read in Digger recently, I think it was yesterday, that there's a bill being introduced for um, banning the hiring and employing of school resource officers. And I'm just curious if we have one pre-pandemic in our district, and if so, would this bill impact us? And if so, what our legislators think about it? Thanks. David, I saw that headline today and uh, I haven't yet read the article, but it was an, you know, I was kind of intrigued to know where that's coming from and certainly who, who brought it about. Um, I think Jeff maybe would be the guy to ask as to whether or not the state really has very many officers in, in school systems. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but um, I, I have an idea as to why somebody would want police to be, uh, you know, not in the school system or, or an officer of some sort. But I also think that that's a that's a discussion that would have a, a pretty valid uh, rebuttal to that. Too. Okay. Yeah. Well, this article claimed more than half of the schools currently in Vermont have a school resource officer. And while they are supported by the students most interacting with those officers, I think there's other studies that people of color may be disproportionately feeling um, um, over, over, overly targeted by those resource officers. So I think that's the, the source of, of where it's coming at. But I'm, I, don't, I don't even know if our district has one. I know we talked of one when there was a security threat a few years ago, and I'm not sure if we ever put one in or not. So we, we had actually um, talked about it at that point in time. Um, during my time here, we have not had one. Um, during the discussions about whether we should have one during the open forums, um, the, the message, at least at the folks that were attending, was loud and clear that they did not want that in the schools um, at that point in time. I can say that um, as a high school principal for a couple of decades um, in Massachusetts, that in those schools, we always did have a resource officer. And it was a very good and cordial relationship that those um, individuals had with all students. Um, and those schools were very diverse, um, especially compared to, to, to most of Vermont. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, we have them here. Well, I'm going to stay on the call uh, for, a, for a good deal after this, but um, I just wanted to say thank you all for, for your positions and for articulating that to us. Um, one thing I forgot to mention in my uh, review of what we've been up to is uh, that the state colleges uh, are, are getting some attention this session. So if you've got thoughts on uh, Vermont Tech or uh, the system at large, please do give me a call. I'm going to put my phone number in the chat shortly. And Senator McDonald um, is here, um, was able to listen in on all the conversation. Um, and on the topic of the uh, resource officers in school said, you know, for the most part, that is a local decision um, that, that he supports, so. I guess I, I do have one question. That's about um, this proposal of resuming um, funding for school construction and rehabilitation and that sort of thing. Where, is there a funding source suggested for what seems to me could be quite a sizable um, financial output? Not yet. That, that's part of the bill. So the, the bill as it currently exists has three parts. One is to reestablish standards. Two is to get a baseline condition study. And three is to get to work trying to identify a source of money. Um, probably the first two are more easily accomplished than the third. But when you think about the the age of the school buildings in Vermont, um, very, very little done in the last 15 or so years, not much in the 15 preceding that. 
and then there was money in the 70s and you know at various intervals but it's difficult to well and i you know in my experience visiting schools at least in randolph you've got schools you know that are in really good condition it's not the same as you'd find in other places so you know i don't mean to sound trite about it but the the old adage is when was the best time to plant a tree 40 years ago or yesterday and we're at the yesterday stage if we don't get if we don't tackle this problem head on then the buildings are going to going to continue to deteriorate and we won't have the type of education system that we want to so there's not a funding system yet but that's part of the legislation will be to try to find one thank you So last call, any other questions or comments um, before we let Jeff and Mark and Jay go? I just would like to thank you all for hosting me. I hope to be down there in person next year. I hope so. All right, thank you very much. We really appreciate um, you guys taking the time to brief us and, and take questions and so forth. Thank you all very right. much. Moving on, um, on our agenda next is just a reminder, really, we've got um, an OSSD budget informational meeting on Wednesday, February 24th. Um, that will be at 6.30 p.m. in the auditorium at RUHS. It's also accessible remotely. Um, so that will just sort of review for our stakeholders, you know, what our budget is as proposed and for, for ready them for the vote, which will take place on March 2nd, um, which is generally town meeting, is not town meeting, at least in Brookfield this year, um, but the vote will continue to take place on March 2nd, um, both in person and uh, by absentee ballots. So uh, we also do have a, um, uh, what is it called? A school meeting, I guess it's called, uh, for, uh, on March, Monday, March 1st, the night before uh, March 2nd vote, uh, which will also take place in the auditorium at RUHS and remotely just to do our regular sort of organizational business for the school board. Um, next, we've got a review and approval of support staff side letter. Um, this was uh, in our agenda packet for uh, school board members to look over. Um, I will plow forward and just introduce it a little and then open it up to comments and questions and clarifications um, if people from the union also want to sort of better explain it than I happen to be doing. Um, this uh, issue sort of was an unresolved issue um, since last the period between March and June of 2020. So as everyone remembers, um, we were forced into uh, emergency remote session um, in mid-March and we remained there until the end of the school year. Um, students were all taught remotely. And so for professional staff, their jobs continued more or less, less sometimes, but I mean, as usual, not easy, but they were still able to do their jobs. Um, some support staff were not uh, necessarily able to do their jobs remotely. Um, so there was this unresolved issue of what to do about support staff who were uh, not able to work because they were either COVID vulnerable health-wise or because they had to do childcare at home and were not uh, able to be in, do their job at the school, for instance, cleaning, cooking, those sorts of things, which did continue um, at the schools itself themselves. Um, at that point, the school district asked those support staff members who were not available to work um, to take their sick leave uh, or leave time first uh, before being paid. Um, and pay continued 
for everyone throughout that time period, but they were people were asked to take their sick leave first. Um, then later in in August or July August period of time, uh, the union and the district sat down and created uh, drafted a memorandum of understanding um, to cover work conditions in this school year 2021. At that point, um, we agreed to uh, excuse uh, people from taking leave time if they had a doctor's order, um, a written doctor's order. Um, and it covered anything uh, sort of described as um, COVID-related uh, condition under the CDC guidelines. Um, but we did not resolve this remaining issue of uh, last year's March to June's healthcare um, leave problem. So right now we have a side, side letter and settlement agreement between the district and the union, um, which is, as I said, uh, written out in our agenda packet, and that is something that we need to discuss and decide whether we are going to approve this as written. Sorry, that was kind of an awkward explanation. Um, there's some history and, yeah, anyway, I, I didn't do a particularly good job on that, but you get the gist of it. So um, anyway, questions, comments, Nora, you're welcome to weigh in. Lane, um, anyone else who would like to sort of better explain or clarify it, that would be welcome. I think you did a nice job, Laura. <laughs> Uh, so thank you. It, 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 what this really is, is just a, um, it's almost a, an addendum to the memorandum of understanding. It would, it would just go into it. It was the one thing that we, that we didn't um, resolve when we were working all of that out. And, it, and hopefully it is now resolved. Yeah, it basically uh, extends to that time period what we decided to do for this current school year. Correct. So it basically will ask those support staff members to put forward a doctor's um, letter uh, for them to recoup that leave time. Right. The the one the one there are two categories where they wouldn't need the doctor's note, and just to make sure people are aware of that, that is if they were um, or are were older than 65 during the time. We figured we didn't need to have them go through the trouble of getting a doctor's note for that because that's a, a matter of record in the personnel file. And um, also the, the folks that needed to do childcare because this was before there were other things in, in place for that. And it was, anyway, there, there are some other reasons that go with that too that I can go into. So those would be the two categories that would not need doctor's notes. So, Nora, the union has decided that they would accept this. Uh, Correct. It has been ratified by the, by the union, yes, okay. by the members of the union. Okay. Are there any other questions or, um, from board members or, or from the public? Um, but board members first. Any other questions or comments? Are we ready for a vote then? Okay, Is may I have a motion to approve the side agreement as written? I move to approve the side agreement as written. This is Hannah. Is there a second? It's Megan, I'll second. Any further discussion? Um, because I can't see all the board members on my screen, I'm going to have to do a voice vote. Um, so I'll call your name and just say uh, aye or nay. Um, Hannah? Aye. Megan? Aye. Anne? Aye. Ashley? Aye. Brian? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Katja? 
Aye. Okay, and I'm in agreement as well. So um, we're all in agreement over the side letter. And so that's great. We can sign that and sort of finish that last piece of unfinished business. Thank you. All right. Um, sorry, I have to go back on my screen here. Next, we have the review of the reduction in force letter. Um, I'm sorry, Laura. Yeah. Before you go, um, this is Ashley. Mm -hmm. And there is the official agreement here in my hand to sign on behalf of the board. Yeah. Um, do I have approval to sign that as the secretary of the board? Or does that need to be signed by you? There is, um, we assigned someone to sign in, uh, in absence of the chair. And I can't remember who that is. It may well be you, since you may may have volunteered as you go by the office all the time. Linda Lubel, do you happen to know who that person is? It is Ashley. Okay. It is Ashley. Yeah. So Laura, I'm going to go ahead and sign it. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. All right, um, Lane. Do you want to speak about this? Um, this riff or, and then we can hear from Nora or someone else on, on behalf of the sure. union. So um, as part of following through on contractual obligations, anytime that the district is considering um, a ref or reduction in force, um, for those that are out there in the audience and don't know what that means, um, basically a layoff, um, we notify the union, give them an opportunity to talk about it with the board um, because the board is actually the deciding uh, authority on whether or not um, to riff uh, an employee. Um, in this particular case, uh, we've discussed this um, a little bit previously over the last year or so. Um, we do have a program at uh, RTCC um, that has been chronically under-enrolled um, for a number of years now, um, and we are at the point where we are planning on closing the program at the end of this year. Um, the staff member who runs that program was notified in writing last year um, to give uh, that person plenty of time um, to look um, to make some decisions about the future. Um, but the intent is to close that program, um, which requires us to lay that employee off to, to riff that employee. And I'm open to questions or thoughts or comments. So I'm not sure procedurally when I should make my statement or not. So let me know. Uh, we've already been informed that this uh, would likely be coming down the pike. So um, as far as board members, this is not the first time we've heard that this was um, going to be a decision that was going to be made. So why don't you present um, your case, Nora? Okay. So um, I'm here on behalf of the, the union um, to ask that they not, that you not riff this position, that this position remain in place. And I have three main reasons for this. Um, one is um, in spite of the, the low enrollment the past couple of years, that, that graphic arts in today's um, world is essential. Um, given the digital nature of the world, it's a skill that's needed for web design, for publishing, for um, political work, for advertising, um, in almost every aspect of our life. Um, and the demand for people in this field is higher than ever before. If we want a program like the Tech Center to be attracting students from other districts, I would say that we would, it's essential that we have a strong um, digital and graphic arts program, um, which this could become. Um, it's it's never been in, in as far as I, in the history and and then asking around for other teachers um, the job of a teacher to recruit students. We, we are not a charter school. We don't you know usually go out to recruit students. Um, if there is recruitment to be done, which I think RTCC does need to to be doing, um, then I would say that that is really the job of the administration to to do. Um, certainly can ask the teacher to um, assist with that, but not to have it say that, you know, if you don't get so many students in your program, then we're going to have to eliminate 
this program. Um, I would also say that this is not the year to be judging enrollment. While I know that notice was given last year that the numbers were low and to try to improve enrollment in this program, um, then the pandemic hit. <laughs> and so, you know, there, there's not really the opportunity to see if any recruitment efforts were done, um, if there was any success to those recruitment efforts or, or not. Um, and again, I would say that that's really the administration's um, job place to do that. Um, but but to judge it on on a year when we've had a pandemic, when it's all that teachers can do to get through each day and to give the students that they do have the best possible education under the circumstances that we're under, um, to then say, well, enrollment is low, um, so we're going to be eliminating it, um, I, I feel is, is unfair. Um, so I think, you know, we don't know after you know the pandemic is over, if there has been recruitment, um, if enrollment numbers could have gone up, um, and if if the program had been promoted, um, what that impact might be. Um, can I add on to uh, Nora's statement? Um, a couple of things here. Um, being a fine arts teacher at the high school, um, I'm closely connected to Michael K. Louis runs that program and the first thing i want to say before anything else is that this gentleman is the ultimate ultimate professional not only is he a great spokesperson for uh, his industry but he is holds his st his students to the highest standards and the result that they come away with is amazing um i want to present to you guys real quick something that i've really been emphasizing to my students over the last um, year or so, and that is a list of art careers. I'm going to show it to you right now. Okay. Um, this is not a fluff subject. This is not a superfluous subject whatsoever. These are life skills. These are skills that students can walk away from a college and be starting at a really nice starting salary and, and grow in the profession. I'm gonna quickly just show you this. And to, boot, to, to, to go any further with this, this is a partial list of things that people can do in the arts, okay? So it hits it hits to my core when we when I when I see things like the graphic design um, program being you know kind of targeted because it seems like it's connected to the arts and that's a thing that we standardly do is kind of is kind of pick on those areas. These careers are just as valuable, just as lucrative as anything else anyone is going to walk away from after their post secondary uh, career. Look at all these jobs, well-paying, highly professional jobs. Uh, it's just the comment I want to make, I'm sorry. And thank you. Are there any other comments? Go ahead, uh, Rebecca. I would like to say that I totally support Craig, and not just because I'm also an art teacher, but because I know lots of people who are employed in the field of graphic arts, and their starting salary is a lot more than teachers. And um, it's the kind of job that people are going to be able to do more and more remotely. So the more people we have doing those types of jobs here in Vermont, um, the better that is, I think, for us. Um, so aside from the benefits of the arts um, and the fact that that really is about visual communication, I think that visual literacy is an essential skill that our students should have. Um, as much as and this isn't putting down early childhood or putting down um, automotive, but maybe first we should be trying to do some more recruitment. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I would 
like to echo that. I think rather than eliminating the program, I think putting the effort into, um, and, there, and therefore eliminating that position, I think putting the effort into modifying or creating the program, um, improving it, changing it, making it more robust that way, and, um, and to, to be looking at this next year as an as a opportunity to do that, rather than saying that RTCC is not going to have um, the graphic arts to pro program any longer. So I'll speak for a little while um, to kind of respond to some of the comments that have been made. First off, um, there's a picture being painted in the portrayals that are being rendered that is not realistic and not accurate to what is happening here. The arts are not being targeted. The arts are not being picked on by this. We have a program um, who extra effort has been put into for at least the last five years in terms of recruitment to make it viable and to keep it healthy. Every year for five years, we get a minimal number of students that are in that are just enough to keep the program viable. And then later in the year after the program has started, those students leave the program and the numbers get down to about three students. This cannot be sustained. It has an impact, a negative impact on everyone else at the tech center because these programs that are not, not reasonably enrolled um, cause tuitions to go up, which puts a drain on all the other programs at the tech center. And yes, the other schools are not supposed to be looking um, at tuition costs uh, as students are making decisions to come to the tech center, but that is not the case. As those costs go up, we do have decreases in enrollments that occur. Um, this has been thought out for a long time. There has been lots of discussions around recruitment. There's been lots of discussions with the individual, excuse me, with the individual that teaches the course. Um, and it still has not made things viable. Um, the graphics arts per se is not necessarily going away. There is a one year plan um, in place to try to combine it with the film program, which has also um, been suffering a little bit in recent years and trying to see if we can combine the concepts of those two into one curriculum under one program. Um, so the program itself um, in part or in whole is not going away. It's gonna be combined with film under a different curriculum that combines the two. Um, to try to keep that going. So I don't know if there's other questions or other thoughts or other concerns. What's the next step here, Lane? Um, so the next, next step, again, this would be a board decision um, to follow through. Um, you guys, in terms of professional staff, um, you are the body that hires. Um, within certain circumstances, you are also the body um, that determines an outcome such as a RIF. Um, so you would have to vote on this. Can I make one more? Um, one more point before um, it goes to the board for discussion is, um, I, I guess I, I would ask that, you know, is this about the program um, or is it about something else? And and if it's about something else, then maybe that needs to be addressed. Um, but, but eliminating, th what we're talking about tonight is eliminating a, a particular program um, from RTCC. It's not about um, the position it's the because the position is or the person it's it's who's teaching it it's about the the position itself the program itself i'm not sure if you're asking a question or making a comment nora well maybe it's kind of a combination of both <laughs> um uh, and and i don't i don't want to get into to a discussion on on a particular um an evaluation of a person's um, performance, job performance or not. I, I think we need to look at this as maybe that, so it is more of a comment. We need to look at this as an evaluation of a particular program and the position that goes with it. I, the reason that we're even looking at this is because we have a program um, that has not been sustaining itself. We have not mentioned, I've not mentioned talk anything whatsoever about an individual here tonight. 
So I'm not sure where that piece is coming in from. The program that we were talking about is Graphic Arts, which has been under enrolled for year after year, despite efforts um, in terms of recruitment. Um, the program itself, as it currently stands, is going away and being combined into a single program combined with filmography. That's the intent. And we're not even sure if that's viable. We want to give that a try for a year and see how that goes. But we're hoping, you know, that in that way we'll be able to preserve those components. So, Lane, I wonder, um, have you researched places where those two programs are put together? Um, because it would be, it's not a very common, you know, amalgamation of different skills. Um, they're both in the arts, but they, they employ pretty different skill levels. And so I just wonder, um, has that been looked at? And then has it look, have you looked at how um, you would meet two different sets of National Core art standards um, to do those? Felicia is an expert. She has taught the graphics arts for years, um, believes it is possible, and they have actually been working on the curriculum for that combination this year. Um, You're lucky to have her. <laughs> oh, she's awesome. She, she really is. I guess the, the other question, and this would be a question, and, and I, um, you know, I was trying to say it very respectfully here, but but to maybe ask what what has been done to promote this program, um, and to look at, um, maybe looking at that a little closer to be trying some other things, um, before eliminating it. Nora, work has been done um, directly uh, with the instructor to generate ideas. Um, additional. Work has been done on the evenings that the students come in to visit the programs. Work has been done on the flyers and the advertisements that go out. Um, the, everything that was possible to try to preserve the program, um, especially given the equipment that that program uses um, is quite extensive, was done to try to preserve it. Um, we are at that point where it has not been viable. It has not been viable for a long time. And we need to make some decisions um, that are going to keep the enrollments up at the tech center um, about programming so that the tech center as a whole can remain viable for all the other instructors that are there. Lane, can I just add, I, I serve both the Randolph Tech Center in my professional job as well as the Hartford Area Tech Center. And Hartford has done the same thing. They've merged the the video and the and the digital and, and they call it sort of illustration and digital media i forget exactly what it is but they've combined these two as well so it's sort of like the way i explain it to students it's sort of like digital media and it and it includes the whole spectrum of of those uh fields No, I think I think it's a very good, very good comment. And again, I have, have a lot of faith in Felicia um, and what she has presented uh, in our conversations over the course of time, as well as with Jason before her, um, was the idea that the combination, you know, has a good possibility of success the way that they're envisioning it. Are there other questions or comments? Lane, would this uh, make sense to have this vote be, um, because really we're not talking about personnel per se, but about programs. So then should the motion reflect that? Yes. Okay. Um, is Are we ready for a motion? Would someone um, make a motion about this, um, closing this program at RTCC? Uh, Laura, this is Ashley. Um, I make a motion that the um, that a program be created at RTCC that incorporates digital film along with media arts for the school year 2021-22. Ashley, would that maintain um, 
both instructors' positions, both um, Carlos Diaz. I don't know if that's enough. I'm sorry, am I speaking out of turn? Um, Ashley, would that can, would that uh, maintain Michael K. Louis' position and as well as um, Carlos Diaz's? No, it wouldn't. We it would be combining two programs into one program. So there would be, as I understand, there would be just a single instructor for a single program. Is there a second to that motion? Sorry about that, Laura. We had the speaker down, so we weren't getting feedback. Okay. So I could hear a motion th from Ashley that uh, we would combine the graphic arts with the digital film program to make a single RTCC program. I heard that motion made. Is there a second? Um, I'm sorry, Laura. I need to um, add to that. And with this motion, it would include the reduction of one staff member. Okay. This is Brian, I'll second. Is there any further question or uh, discussion before we take a vote? Hearing none, um, we will do a roll call vote uh, again. Um, please say A or nay. Uh, Anna. Nay. Uh, Meg. Hi. Ann. Hi. Ashley. Hi. Brian. Hi. Rachel? Aye. Gotcha. Aye. Did you say no or or I? Is it I? Thank you. And I'm in favor of uh, I as well. Um, so the vote stands seven to one. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Let's um, move on. Uh, Next, we have a discussion, an update from Anne Kaplan and perhaps Lane as well about the strategic planning process that's under undergoing. Anne? So we have had um, four feedback sessions so far um, with our focus groups. Um, the first series of feedback sessions have been focused on the middle school, um, uh, academics and climate, uh, transition and structure. And we've uh, heard from our UHS students, alumni, non-teaching staff, and uh, the business and nonprofit community. Uh, community leaders, um, and we have four more to go. They're all gonna be happening, I believe it's uh, this week. Yes, they'll all be done by the 11th. Um, so we're having on the February 9th, the middle school students feedback forum. Uh, on the 10th, the administrators. On the 11th, the uh, professional teaching staff, and then on the 11th, also um, parents. Um, and then what's gonna happen is the design team for the strategic plan is we're gonna sort of synthesize that data. We're also trying to push out to the community through um, the, the uh, board website, um, Facebook, um, a front porch forum, the newspaper, we're gonna be putting out um, a link to a survey. And basically that will be for community members who haven't been in these, these uh, focus group sessions. 
to provide that same feedback. So they're going to have the same questions. And, um, and then the design team has to take that information and sort of synthesize it down into a few um, goals. So we're going to have our meeting to do that on the 16th on those middle school questions. And then um, we have a whole nother series. So again, eight feedback sessions with the same um, feedback groups that are gonna be focused more on the high school. Um, and the high school focus is also gonna be on academics and climate. And then, uh, oh, I didn't take the actual note. So academics, climate, and there might be something else that I can't remember exactly, but it's sort of taking those um, initial areas that the board had done in its initial uh, strategic planning process and, and developing those. Um, so things are going pretty well. It's been great to, um, I so far I've only, um, I've overheard the alumni because my son participated and then I was a part of the um, uh, community leaders and business nonprofit um, group. So, um, but it, it's really, um, it's been kind of interesting to hear what folks have to say. Can I just ask, how are you getting students to engage in a feedback group? Students. Um, so uh, we have, well, we have a number of staff people. So teachers um, are in this group. So they already have a bit of a relationship um, with the teachers. So it's been, it's been working well. And in addition to the, the surveys going out to the community, those are also going to go out to individual students because Again, these forums are taking part on on a you know an electronic Google Meet like this. Um, so some students are less um, are less open or or you know it's a little intimidating to come in and and be a small group and do a Google Meet where you're having to uh, express your opinions. So that's also all these surveys are going out and all students will be able to give us feedback so um, but we're just doing the focus groups with a small number of, of uh, students as well as all the other uh, groups as well we're keeping the numbers sort of slow uh, small so that you can have a little bit of a more intimate um, experience and we're trying to make sure that we've got a broad uh, and diverse representation of the community it's a and, little bit and, hard. and can i just jump in for a second sure. the way i understood just to answer the question about who um how are they selecting students um from what i understand there is it's driven by student leadership particularly at the high school and that was what elicited the middle school feedback from this past um interview survey uh meeting that they had so it I think it is student driven. I just want to add that to it. Or a combination of both. Lane, was there anything you wanted to add to the uh, strategic planning discussion? Just a, a quick uh, thank you for David Roller and Lisa Floyd, which have um, who have been a part of this process. The uh, admin team is meeting to go through its own process related to this, which will be on Wednesday to provide our feedback um, at our uh, Wednesday cabinet meeting. We'll spend some time on it, so I think it'll be fun. Any other uh, questions or comments? Um for Ann or for Lane around strategic planning? Thanks, Ann, for your work on this. All right. Um, well, next on our uh, agenda, Lane, is a negotiations update. So 
Would you speak to that? Yeah, we had our uh, first round of negotiations um, on the teacher's contract that happened last week on February 2nd. Um, the big part of that meeting was that both sides get their initial kind of proposals on the table about what potential changes um, they're looking for. Um, the district on its side uh, made five different proposals. Um, the first was that it asked to reduce the length of time a position is held available for a staff member on long-term disability. Um, currently it's at two years um, and we were asking for that to be reduced uh, to the contract year in which the disability occurred. Um, we asked for the ability to be able to lay off uh, a technical center teacher whose enrollment falls to zero during a contract year. Um, they would still be able to keep their uh, seniority, their bumping rights, um, but the bumping rights would uh, come into play at the end of that contract year. Um, we asked to reduce the yearly allotment of sick days from 18 to 16, and then to eliminate uh, the remaining emergency days uh, that are a part of the contract. Um, and probably the most important one um, for us was we asked to be able to front load um, the full professional development days to the beginning of the year. Um, as part of that as a, a separate piece um, was uh, seeking kind of the elimination of the clause that is in the contract um, that allows the teachers not to make up the first two snow days each year. Um, we pay them 185 days a year as per the contract, um, but two of the days, if there's snow days, they don't have to make up. So typically in Vermont, um, it's 183 days um, that they, they work. Um, we offered a one-year contract um, with concerns about uh, the next round of state health care negotiations that are happening next year um, because we can't tell what the financial landscape is going to be um, two years out and a salary increase of 1.6% including STEP. Um, on the union side, they made five requests. Um, the teachers are seeking an early retirement slash resignation benefit. Um, they are asking that a teacher who has 25 years of teaching experience overall uh, with 10 years in district, um, they are asking the district to provide them with a cash payout of 60% of their salary. Um, they would like an additional 60% of their last year's salary to buy additional times towards retirement from the state. They are asking the district to pay for insurance coverage for an individual for one year after they leave the district. Um, in a separate proposal, um, they asked to increase the number of paid leave days they can use under the Family Medical Leave Act uh, from the current 30 days to 60 days. Um, they asked for each teacher to have one hour of self-directed time um, free from duties during each workday um, that does not include their lunch time. Uh, they asked the district uh, to hire a consultant to do an annual audit of indoor air quality. And then they asked to have uh, air quality inspections done, um, quite extensive ones on all buildings and rooms monthly. Um, they are seeking a two-year contract and they are seeking an increase in salary of 13% over those two years, including STEP. Um, the first round of negotiations with the support staff uh, will be this week on the 11th. And then the second round with the teachers will be on February 16th at 5.30 p.m. The one thing, um, and there may be questions I'm happy to answer, um, the board, as, as part of the agreements that we have um, in terms of ground rules, there always needs to be somebody uh, from the district side who has the ability to sign off on tentative agreements. And things have gone very well in the last uh, couple of years, um, but I would ask the board to do a vote um, to allow me the authority uh, to sign off on tentative agreements if a board member is not present at those negotiation sessions, just in case. Um, I thought we did that last year and that you do right now have that authority. Uh, I would assume that that was good for last year's negotiations. Um, if that's the understanding of the board, you know, I'm happy to not have you vote again. Well, we, we could uh, we could vote again and give you that right if we so decide, I guess. Um, yep. So are there questions from anyone uh, to Lane about um, the first round or first, yeah, step of negotiations this year?
do we want to um, vote on giving Lane the authority to sign on our behalf um, in case no board member is present? Laura, I got one que quick question. Does okay, go ahead. the board members on the committee have authority to sign? Yes, we do. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, it would just be in the absence of any uh, board members in that meeting at that time. So if it is in our interest, um, would I have a motion uh, to to allow Lane to sign in uh, the absence of a board member during, um, you know, in a tentative agreement uh, during negotiations? So moved. Is there a second? Uh, it's actually a second. Any further discussion? Just, just for my information, who right now is on the uh, high, uh, the professional staff negotiations team as far as we're going? So it's Brian, Hannah, and Ashley. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like most often someone has been there. Um, which it's is Megan, great. And Ashley. Laura. Yeah. You said it's you Megan. said professional staff, right? Yes. So that's me and Hannah and Meg. Okay. Great. Um, so we've got a motion on the table here. Um, are we ready for a vote? Not hearing any other discussion or questions. Um, I guess I'll go around again since I still cannot see you all. Hannah, um, are you in favor? In favor? Can, I, can I say a comment? Is that sure. okay? All right. Um, I think that Lane has uh, been a super, super strong uh, influence in this district. I think he's been a great uh, superintendent and has done a great job. I get really nervous about giving that kind of straight up sign off power to a single individual in absence of others. Um, that's, that's all I'm going to say on it. I think he's got a really great level head. I think he makes great decisions. I just don't like that unilateral kind of um, paradigm. And, and that is exactly why we, we do assign three board members to be um, present at these meetings, and they uh, do generally um, try to be there. Um, I, I do think it's important for a, to have a board presence. Um, Thank you for your comment. Um, so, Hannah, I'm going to start with you again. Are you st in favor of this motion? Aye. Uh, Meg? Aye. Anne? Aye. Ashley? Aye. Brian? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Katja? Aye. And I'm in favor as well. Thank you, everybody. Um, Next, we have uh, two uh, new EL monitoring reports um, submitted by Lane. This is a first read of these reports. Uh, we will approve them next month. So please, uh, if you have further questions, Lane will give us a brief overview right now if he wants to, but uh, you can both read them over and get further information at the OSSD office for background materials. Um, Lane, do you want to speak to either of them, or are they? Yeah, um, they're they're kind of boilerplate, and it's kind of nice that they've timed them um, during this time of the year to kind of go along with budget season. Uh, executive lim limitation two point three is financial conditions and activities. Um, basically, what it's doing is making sure that we're following accepted protocols uh, to prevent putting the district in a state of financial jeopardy. Um, we're not spending more than we receive. Uh, we're spending it on what's agreed to and then making sure that we're collecting what's owed to us in a timely manner. And um, we are in compliance. I'm reporting that we're in compliance on EL 2.3. EL 2.6 is about asset protection. Um, you know, are we taking care of our facilities? Are we safeguarding our money? Um, and a lot of that is, you know, making sure that we're carrying a reasonable amount of insurance. And um, are we preventing uh, conflict uh, when we make large per 
purchases, you know, making sure that we're not making deals with people we know um, as opposed to following through on what's required uh, under state contract law um, in terms of going out to bid and, and whatnot. So just kind of in general what those two are about. Thank you. And um, any, does someone have a question? Sorry. Okay. Um, please take the time to thoroughly read those over and review them so we're ready for a vote next month. All right. Um, next, we have a consent agenda. First, to uh, approve the minutes from our OSSD meeting on the 11th of January. We need to approve a professional contract, um, a title funded teacher. Um, we need to approve the sum, uh, summary of accounts of trustees on the fake Howdry uh, account. And we need to approve the benefit fit plan document. All are available in our packet. Um, were there any additions or substitutions, uh, corrections to the minutes? Okay. So, Laura, do you want to um, approve the entire consent agenda packet or one by one? Um, I would suggest that we could do them as, as a whole. Um, they're pretty routine. Um, if someone has an obje objection to that, please state so. Otherwise, I'd like to just approve them as one. Was there someone speaking? I can't hear you. Okay. All right. Um, if there's any, no further questions or uh, corrections, comments about these, um, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as a whole? I'll move to to approve the consent agenda as a whole. Is there a second? A second. Um, Hannah, are you aye or nay? Aye. Meg? Aye. Ann? Aye. Ashley? Aye. Brian? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Gotcha. I, and I'm in favor as well. Thank you, everybody. Um, next, let me scroll down here. So um, we've got the superintendent's report. Is there something you want to add or highlight, Lane, in your report? I think, I think uh, the biggest piece to kind of talk about um, for just a minute or two goes along with what our, our legislators had mentioned um, at the beginning of the year when we planned out the school budget, uh, their predictions for the money flowing into the education fund were very, very dire. Um, what they realized after the fact, you know, after all the, the folks, um, all the districts in the state had gone through their budget processes, um, is that actually there was a lot more money that flowed into the education fund this year uh, than they had thought or that they had predicted. Um, a lot of it came from the fact, I, if, if I remember my reading correctly, that um, there was a lot of online buying and the state of Vermont is now taxing for online purchases um, during this time of COVID. Um, and some of it was due to uh, coronavirus relief funding um, that came in. And so when I did the original budget, at least in the original presentation with the board, um, what I said was, you know, uh, using some of the surplus to, to subsidize, you know, we were looking at the average uh, homeowner's taxes going up by $96 a year. Um, the reality is, is right now what they are predicting um, for a new property yield, um, which is basically one of the ways of interpreting that is how much money they give us per enrolled student, um, has gone up enough that our tax increase will be zero. Um, based upon what they're talking about in the Senate right now. Um, if they actually increase it further to the amount that uh, Jeff Francis spoke of today, 
our taxes will actually go down um, on average for the average homeowner in our three towns by about $200 per year. Um, so it all depends upon where they land, but the out outlook is actually pretty good in terms of the impact that the school budget will have on folks' taxes. Um, at, at a minimum, what's expected um, in terms of them adjusting the yield um, is going to put us at a, at a neutral footing. Um, in other words, a zero, zero increase to the communities, which is awesome. So that's the only thing that I wanted to talk about because it's good news. So. I see there's principal's reports, also the financials. How are we doing as a district right now? Actually really good. Um, I talk about, you know, I do look at, at some of the finer uh, details of the finer lines that are in the budget, but the rule of thumb is I take a look at how many months we are in, I do a division, and right now we're 58% through the school year, so that means we should have at least 58% of our budgets left at, at the, the, the school district level and at RTCC. Um, right now, um, RTCC has got 59% of its budget left, so we're right on target. Um, OSSD, we've got 52.88% left. Um, but the reason that is, is that we're still waiting for $700,000 in uh, coronavirus relief funds to come in and replenish the extra that we used um, to kind of support operations during this time of COVID. So we're actually in really, really good shape um, right now. Uh, we also, uh, a little bit of that is uh, we accelerated some of the maintenance work this year too. So stuff that would have been spread out a little bit more over the course of the year um, happened a little bit earlier in the year. So, but no, we're in good shape and Robin gave, her, gave it her stamp of approval when I talked with her this afternoon. Okay, we're ready for the board evaluation. How'd we do? All right. Um, ready? Okay. So we got lots of fours and fives. Uh, this meeting, I felt like we did a really, really nice job sticking to our agenda tonight um, and being timely, which is great. Um, the meeting was very well attended by all board members and staff, so thank you. Uh, the board appears to be prepared and that we proceeded without interruption or distraction. Um, there was discussion prior to decision making as to why we were following that process. Um, our participation was not um, balanced across the board. Um, that's probably something we could certainly work on. Um, however, people listened attently and Folks were treated with respect and courtesy. Um, our work tonight certainly did focus on a policy level and not on an operational level, which is the way we're supposed to work. And um, the actions considered by the board were our duty to consider. Um, kind of jumping around, um, I think we should spend a minute or two um, acknowledging our board chair, as this is, I believe, maybe her last meeting, she thinks. Um, Laura, once, he did, once again, did an outstanding job um, leading the discussion and leading our board. So I think we can all thank her for her years of service. Thank you um, very much. Thank you. Wish you were here, Laura. <laughs> um, and I also would like to give a shout out to Ann Kaplan. I think she's clearly doing um, an excellent job owning the strategic planning process. Really good work is happening and I have no doubt it is a lot of extra time. So huge kudos to Ann for that good work. So overall, I think we did a great job, team. Well, thank you. Thanks for doing the evaluative yeah. work. Um, we do have um, an executive session uh, to talk about some personnel issues. And um, following that, we will do have time because we're so early to do a policy governance training. So we will return to this, um, to this link for that. Um, and uh, for now, though, we will leave this link and move to an executive session. So thank you, everyone, for attending.
We'll be back.